We're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. Um, we will be looking at Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. So uh, let's pray and read through our text together, and then we will look at our study. So Matthew chapter 9, beginning in chapter 9, verse 1. It says, So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. And then behold, they brought to him a paralytic laying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose, and he departed to his house. Now, when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. And now it happened. As Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine in new wineskins, and both are preserved. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly, a woman who had a flow of blood for twelve years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Lord, again, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that we can study it and see your life. We thank you that you left this for us so that we could know all that you did. We could know all that we need to know to be able to follow you, to be able to have a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that as we look at this passage tonight, that Lord, you'd speak to our hearts, that we would grow in you. We thank you and we praise your name, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So last week... Uh, We finished Matthew chapter 8. We looked at Matthew chapter 8 and we had seen how Jesus and his disciples, they'd gotten into a boat to cross over the Sea of Galilee. And as Jesus slept, they encountered a severe storm, one that had waves that were covering the boat and they were being swamped. Fearing the storms, the disciples went to Jesus and they woke him crying out for him to save them. And Jesus got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea and all was calm. All was calm until they got to shore. Because there they were met immediately by two demon-possessed men who were described as coming out of the tombs and were also described as being so exceedingly fierce that no one could pass that way. And in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke, they're described in greater detail. We're told that they could not be bound with chains and shackles as they were able to pull them apart and break them in pieces. And night and day, we were told that they would howl and cry out and cut themselves with stones. And we're told that they ran around without clothing and lived in the tombs. It's a horrendous view 
of how these demons were tormenting these men and how the demons were completely bent on their destruction. And here this boat comes, fresh out of the storm, disciples still dripping wet and grateful to be at shore, still marveling at Jesus and saying, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? And the greeting party that comes to meet them are these guys coming out of the tombs. And as Matthew states, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. Naked, bloody from mutilation by cutting themselves, probably still dragging along with them the remnants of the shackles and chains, filthy, howling and crying out, what have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? The disciples were probably ready to get right back in the boat and face another storm. Then look at these guys. But Jesus had been met by the ones that he had intended to come and see. Not the demons, but the men who needed freedom. Jesus was absolutely in the right place in God's perfect timing, intended these two men, set them free, casting the legion of demons out and breathing life into these men. Jesus had just shown full authority over nature and, uh, and their trip across the lake when he calmed the storm. And now he shows his full authority in the spiritual realm, realm as he rebuked and cast out these demons. Such a wonderful thing. Seeing Jesus in full authority over the demons. He didn't have to contend with them. He didn't have to argue with them or deal with them or bind them or go through any machinations. But with one word, he bid them be gone, and they were. And the response he got from the community that would no longer have to be terrorized by the demonic forces indwelling these men was a request for him to leave them alone. And so he did. He had accomplished what he came over to do. Jesus cared about those two men enough that he made that one trip all the way across the lake, calmed a storm, one trip all the way across the lake just to set them free. Just like the time he had to go up to Samaria to meet that one woman by the well. He cared about the community there enough where those men were to leave those men with them to tell of the wonderful works that God had done for them. And now we get to chapter 9. In chapter 9, verse 1, it says, So he got into a boat, he crossed over, and he came to his own city. And again, we read a few weeks ago, Jesus had a base in Capernaum. That was where he based his ministry, and he would stay at Peter's house when they were there. <clears throat> so that's where they head back. And it goes on to say, in verse 2, Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Now, the word paralytic can also be translated as palsy. And in some editions, the Bible passage of Luke 5.18 that talks about this is translated to refer to a man which was taken with palsy. <clears throat> More modern editions simply refer to a man who is paralyzed. Although the term historically has been associated with paralysis in general. It's now almost commonly used in connection with the word cerebral, like in brain. So cerebral palsy. So palsy is a medical term which refers to various types of paralysis, often accompanied by weakness and the loss of feeling, uncontrolled body movement, such as shaking. And there's a few specific kinds of palsy, like Bell's palsy or Bulber palsy or cerebral palsy and many others. And they all do different things to the body. Some involve uh, pretty major paralysis. Regardless of what this guy's affliction was, they had to lower him down on a, on a stretcher. He wasn't able to walk in to see Jesus. And in Mark chapter 2 and Luke chapter 5, we also see this encounter. And Mark and Luke go into greater detail on the circumstances surrounding the men bringing the paralytic. They describe how the crowd was so large that there was no longer any room to get to the door and receive people. And that the friends of the men were so intent on getting him to Jesus that they were actively seeking a way to get him there. And so they went to the roof and they started to dig. <clears throat> now, common in the houses of the time were flat rooftop porches where they could go in the cool of the evening. And from the back of the house, typically, there were access steps. 
And that's right where they go. And the roof was usually made of wood, but then covered with dried mud and hardened and then covered with branches over that mud and straw and more dried and hardened mud. And that's what they started digging through. And now in Mark, it says that Jesus was in the house teaching. So there was a huge crowd. Jesus is teaching. And all of a sudden, during the Bible study, there's noise up on the roof in the ceiling. Dust and debris starts falling. And a hole starts to open up. Imagine that scene. Do you think Jesus was distracted or do you think he just kept on teaching while all that's going on? I think he probably just kept on teaching. He knew what was to come. But they open that hole little by little, probably test to see if he'll fit, open it up some more, and finally get it to the point where they can lower him right down in front of Jesus. What do you think Peter was thinking about? We're told they were in Peter's house. Just knowing Peter, I imagine he's watching all that go on and go, what are they doing on my roof and wondering why they're digging through it. So these friends lower the paralytic in front of Jesus and are probably thinking, yeah, here we go. We got him to Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. I would imagine those friends still up on the roof are looking through the hole going, wait, wait, no, that's great and all, but that's not why we dropped him in front of you. We want our friend to be healed. We want him to walk. What do you think that man was thinking though? Because it says that Jesus saw the faith of the friends, not of the paralytic, that he saw their faith. I imagine that guy, I wonder how willing he was to go along with this. Really? You're going to drop me through? Really, dude? You're going to drop me through the roof in front of all these people? You're going to put me down in front of Jesus, in front of all these people through the roof, while Peter's scowling at me because you're ruining his roof. You're dropping me in front of him. Only to get there, and be told, son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. When he saw their faith, the faith of the men, he turned to the paralytic and said to him, son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. I think that paralytic was being lowered and looked at Jesus and saw what the disciples had wondered at when they were at the boat and what the demons knew when the demons encountered her, that he was just lowered in front of the one who was so much greater, so much more than just a man. I'm sure he looked in the eyes of Jesus and all he thought was, I am so sinful. How can I even be in his presence? And I think that. Why do I think that? Because Jesus always tended to the real need in people. He always answered the real question of the heart. And I'm sure that Jesus knew that even though this man needed a healing in body, he needed a healing in heart first. Not that the man was paralyzed in body because of sin, but he was paralyzed by sin in his body. And Jesus was going to heal both. And I will bet at that moment, looking at Jesus, being set free from the sin he knew in his heart, he probably didn't care at all about the physical anymore because he knew Jesus had just taken care of the eternal. The other thing is that Jesus calls him son. Do you know this is the only place in the Gospels where it's recorded that Jesus looks at a man and calls him son? Where Jesus looks at a man and calls him son. The word used is just that, that tender relationship of a father and son taking this man as his own and ministering to him in exactly the way he needed it. A paralytic, no doubt looked down upon by the righteous, looked down upon as sinful because of the affliction he faced in his body. But Jesus looked at him and sees what he will be, his son, fully forgiven and fully restored. And now all Matthew recorded was the summary of the interaction because Matthew focuses on what Jesus did and said primarily throughout his whole gospel. Jesus the king is his emphasis. He's trying to show his authority as God and man. It was written by a Jew to Jews about a Jew. That was his emphasis. Jesus, fully God, fully man, acting with the full authority of God, claims this man as his own by calling him his son, and then like a father with his child, forgives him. And out of that, we see the response. In verse 3, at once, some of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes, which would be a right response if Jesus was just a man. But what they couldn't see and refused to see was Jesus was not just a man. Just a chapter earlier, we saw a scribe come up and express the desire to follow Jesus. And Jesus told him the cost of following him. And that scribe chose not to. 
And now we see the adversarial relationship that the scribes primarily had with Jesus as they start to judge him as just another man. And even then, when you look at the language used, it actually translates more like this. This blasphemes. Man is inferred. It's not directly written into the phrase. It's like they had no idea what they should really call him, but were unwilling to call him what he really is. They didn't know what to call him, even in their hearts. They meant this, this upstart, this nobody, this strange being. The demons knew who he was, but these religious leaders were blind to him. In verse four, it says, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts, which should have been enough to make them go, uh oh, you know, should have been enough to prove his deity to them. But he goes on to explain to them the other reason for this encounter in verse five, for which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you or to say, arise and walk, but that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed and go to your house but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Jesus showed his right to forgive sins by showing his power to heal this man. Both healing and forgiveness are impossible with man. Yet only the promise of healing could be immediately proven because you can't see someone's sin being forgiven, but you can see that they're healed. And Jesus used it as a proof. And in verse 7, it says, And he arose, the paralytic arose, and departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. Jesus answered his own question before the religious leaders had time to do it. Since he could make good on his claim to heal the man, it gave proof of his claim to also have the authority to forgive sins. The man is healed instantly. He gets up and he goes home. You know, there's no mention of the roof being repaired, by the way. And I'm sure the friends watching through the hole they created were so happy they left and went with the guy. I doubt they repaired the roof. I'm not sure how much rejoicing Peter did right then. But the multitudes, they marveled and they glorified God. And Jesus didn't heal in ways to bring attention to himself. That wasn't his purpose. He was healing to bring glory to God, just being the example of what he commanded us to do in Matthew 5, 16 where he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. In verse nine, it says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. And here we see Jesus calling Matthew to leave his job and follow him full time. Mark and Luke record that his name was Levi, the son of Alphaeus. But much like with Peter, Jesus gave him a new name, Matthew, meaning gift of Jehovah. We're told later in Matthew 10, 3 about another son of Alphaeus, James, the brother of Matthew. And so one they called James the less to distinguish him from James, the brother of John. And when you look at his given name, Levi, it would denote that his family was more than likely of the tribe of Levi. And one going from the tribe with priestly responsibility to a job collecting taxes would be a huge leap and a major disappointment and a major disgrace to his family. So when you look at Matthew and what he did for a living, what a gift from God it must have been to receive a name like Matthew from Jesus, gift of Jehovah. A man named Matthew sitting in the tax office. Now tax collectors were not only notorious sinners, but they were also properly regarded as collaborators with the Romans against their fellow Jews. That was the view of them. Nobody liked the man who sat at the tax office. I think it's still true today. Nobody likes the man that's sitting in the tax office. The Jewish people rightly thought of them as traitors because they worked for the Roman government. They had the force of Roman soldiers behind them to make people pay their taxes. They were the most visible Jewish collaborators with Rome. And the Jewish people rightly considered them extortioners because they were allowed to keep for themselves whatever they overcollected. That's how they made their income. A tax collector would bid, among others, 
for the tax collecting contract in specific areas. For example, many tax collectors might want to have the tax contract for a city like Capernaum. And the Romans awarded the contract to the highest bidder. So a man may then would collect taxes. He would win that award for that contract. He would collect the taxes. He would be due to pay the Romans what he promised to give them for a tax return. But whatever he, kept, he collected over that, he would get to keep. Therefore, there's a whole lot of incentive for tax collectors to overcharge and cheat any way they could. It was pure profit for them. Because when a Jew entered the custom service, he was regarded as an outcast from society. He was disqualified as a judge or a witness in a court session. He was excommunicated from the synagogue. And in the eyes of the community, his disgrace extended to his family. And that's who Jesus called. Matthew. Levi. Going from a priestly lineage to tax collecting. And many speculate that he must have seen the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, possibly of his own family. I must have wanted nothing to do with that. And much like many who grew up in church today, only to see the difference between what the church says and what they do. Probably figuring the best he could do was just to get all he can for now and live for himself. Yet obviously seeing this Jesus and what he was doing and saying and living and probably also seen who it was that didn't like Jesus. And he was ready for the call. Unlike the scribe of chapter 8, Matthew had already counted the cost. Because when Jesus said, follow me, he arose immediately and followed him, knowing that once he did, he could never go back to being a tax collector. And now understanding how almost everyone hated tax collectors, it's remarkable to see how Jesus loved and called Matthew. It proved to be a well-placed love. Matthew responded to Jesus' invitation by leaving his tax collecting business and following Jesus and eventually writing the gospel we're reading now. In one way, this was more of a sacrifice than some of the other disciples made. Peter and John, James, they could have easily gone back to their fishing business. But Levi, Matthew, he wouldn't have been able to go back to tax collecting. And there's archaeological evidence that fish were taken from the Sea of Galilee when the, the fishermen would catch those fish, that those fish would be taxed. You know, well, I guess not the fish, the fishermen would be taxed for the fish that they collected. So Jesus took as his disciple, the tax man that very well could have been one taking money from Peter, James, and John and the other fishermen among the disciples. Think of that dynamic. Not to mention any of the others that lived in that area that he may have been the tax collector of. That probably made for some awkward in introductions. But we're told in verse 10 that now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. We're told in Luke that this was Matthew's house and that it was a large gathering of people. And the context also suggests that this was a gathering of Matthew's friends and former business associates. And it looks as if Matthew, being so excited to have Jesus call out to him and accept him, in turn, he couldn't help but share Jesus with all those people that he knew so they could see his love and acceptance as well and spread hope to other sinners and the hopeless and the outcast. But in verse 11, it says, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So first the scribes called Jesus a blasphemer. And now the Pharisees complain about his behavior. And the main concern of a Pharisee was practical observant of the law. We've gone through that before. In an outward way that would justify themselves in their own eyes to God, which made them extremely self-righteous. And seeing Jesus eating with these sinners was more than they could take for such a prominent rabbi. Eating together in that culture, it was extremely intimate. You were reclining at a table. And in the, uh, the law of Judaism, the Pharisees, that they, how they had added to that and steadily added to it is said that a tax collector would rendered unclean any house he entered into. If a tax collector went into a house, the house was considered unclean. 
And in another uh, of the laws, it said to be a guest in any of a house of a sinner disqualified a man from being considered as one observing all the rules of tithing and purity. It made him unclean as well. And here's Jesus reclining and dining with a whole houseful of tax collectors and sinners. Now, that the Pharisees could talk to the disciples who were there with Jesus, enjoying the presence of Matthew and Matthew's friends, <clears throat> makes me wonder, how did the Pharisees go and talk to them without being unclean themselves by going in the house to talk to them? But we don't know. It doesn't say that. Makes me wonder, though, how they were able to ask their questions without defiling themselves. But verse 12 says, When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And in that passage, people were still good at bringing their sacrifices, but they had forsaken mercy. And it says they had abandoned mercy because they gave up the knowledge of God and truth. God made clear that a right heart before him is more important than any sacrifice we could make. That the, it's always a matter of the heart. And the Pharisees had neglected and forgotten this aspect of service of God. Also, it's of note of how Jesus responded to him. How he said, go and learn what this means. That was a common practice for a rabbi or a teacher or a scribe or a Pharisee to respond to questions in this manner. When a person of any kind would come and ask for input or advice, it was common to tell them, go and learn what this means, and then recite a passage to them. And again, the common, did, the common people did not have the means to just go look something up. And if they did have the ability to research, it sure wasn't broken up by chapter and verse for them to find. But it was mainly a way that the educated could potentially lord their position over the common. And here Jesus lets them know they need to go and learn one thing. God wants the heart, not just the outward. But Jesus says it's this way. To ones who can and should go and learn what this means. Go and learn what this means. I desired mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. It's always a matter of the heart. In verse 14, it says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will, will be taken away from him, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tears made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Now, John the Baptist had a ministry of repentance and preparation for the coming Messiah. His was a message bent towards humbling yourself before God. And hence, fasting would have made sense for that kind of message. And we talked a few weeks ago about the outward ceremonial practice that the Pharisees would do when they fast. They would fast once or twice a week. And, look, and they were looking for all to see like they were fasting because they were dressed grungy with dirty faces and downcast expressions for the sake of people, seeing how righteous they were because they were fasting. Well, John's disciples wondered why the disciples of Jesus didn't have to do this. It's a fair question. And here Jesus explains to them what John meant by he must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus is the bridegroom. And as such, while he was with them, there was no room for mourning. But he gives his first forewarning that there will be a time where that's warranted. And then Jesus gave two illustrations of what he meant when he said, do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And he gave the illustrations of the patches on a garment and the wineskins with wine. And Jesus explained that he did not come to repair or reform the old institutions of Judaism, but to institute a new covenant altogether. 
The new covenant doesn't just improve the old, it replaces it and goes beyond it. And Jesus' reference to the wineskins was his announcement that the present institutions of Judaism could not and would not contain his new wine. He would form a new institution, the church, that would bring Jew and Gentile together into a completely new body. And Jesus reminds us that tradition and rituals are not the way to please God. God will often look for new vessels to contain his new work until those vessels eventually make themselves unusable. And this reminds us that the religious establishment of any age is not necessarily pleasing to Jesus. Sometimes it's in direct opposition to, or at least resisting his work. Jesus came to introduce something brand new, not to patch up something old. This is what salvation is all about. In doing this, Jesus doesn't just, just destroy the, the old, the law, but he fulfills it. Just in the illustration that I read that was an, like an acorn is fulfilled when it grows into an oak tree. There's a sense in which the acorn is gone, but the purpose is fulfilled in greatness. And in verse 18, it says this. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her. And she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Now, next week, we're going to pick it up again, starting in this verse, and go over this passage. But I want to look at what happened on the way to this man's house this week. Because verse 20 says this And suddenly, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Now this woman had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. She was hemorrhaging, a heavy flow of blood, and it denotes that it was menstrual in nature, which according to the law in Leviticus 15 made her and anything she touched, sat on, slept on, anything or anyone, it made them unclean as well. She could no longer be around her husband, who in all likelihood gave her a certificate of, of divorce, as they would have had trouble even being in the same house. And we're told that she suffered many things at the hands of doctors and had spent all that she had on them and only gotten worse. She wouldn't have been able to touch or hold any of her children. She would have been very alone, an outcast, just like a leper. I read that there were lots of superstitions about how to cure this type of ailment. The one that made me laugh was this one. It, one, it involved finding an ostrich egg in a certain region. They had to go find an ostrich egg and then carry it around in a bundle. And that having that ostrich egg with them in that bundle would stop the flow of blood. There we go. Now, give me your insurance card. I'll charge them. Whatever they don't cover will be your copay. There's your prescription. Go find an ostrich egg. But that's the type of stuff that she was spending her money on at the hands of doctors that were just not tending to her or tending her as best they could then. But she was, all of her money was gone. So we're thinking, I think something, I think her thinking about Man, if I could only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. It kind of smacks of that type of thing. Well, maybe, maybe if I just touch him, if I just touch him, maybe I could be made well. Regardless of her situation, like the leper we read about in chapter 8, it made her one who was unclean, one whose touch or presence made others unclean. And she's braving a crowd. She's getting her way through the crowd, probably low, because she was just going to try and touch the hem of his garment as he passed. Probably trying not to make anyone else unclean, but at the same time not caring anymore. Like that leper, all she cared about was getting to Jesus. So she braved the crowd, just in the hope of touching him. She hoped to get in and touch him without anyone knowing, including Jesus, and sneak back out. No harm, no foul, I didn't make anyone unclean, no one knew I was there. She was just trying to get to Jesus, but Jesus knew. He knew it was her, and he knew that the healing power that went out of him was for her. And in the midst of the crowd, I wonder how much of it was her trying to get to Jesus 
And how much of it was Jesus making sure he got to her? You know what I mean? Because through that crowd, through that multitude, one way or another, she got there, touched him, and the power of God flowed through Jesus. And Jesus knew exactly when she touched him. And he turned, and we're told in other accounts that he asked who touched him. Not because he didn't know, but to give her the chance to own it. And we're going to go over this in more detail next week. But what I want to look at now is how Jesus responded. Jesus makes sure that she knows she was healed, not because of a magical touch of his garment. But he says, your faith has made you well. But the big thing Jesus says to her is just before that, he says, be of good cheer, daughter. Be of good cheer, daughter. Much like where he called the paralytic son. This is the only place in the Gospels where Jesus calls a woman daughter. This unclean outcast. A woman who has suffered at the hands of doctors, who's been shunned by society. Jesus calls her tenderly his daughter and owns her in the fullness of her suffering and sets her free. This woman, who have, would have been looked at with scorn, has the most wonderful distinction of being the one and only woman that we have record of Jesus treating in this way, calling her daughter. An expression which immediately take away all the fear she would have had and would tell her all she needed to know of Jesus' love for her. Daughter, it's okay. You're healed. You're mine. Be of good cheer. In the first part of this chapter, we saw how the paralytic was treated by Jesus. Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And we see how Jesus treats this woman. Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And in between, we see how Jesus called the hated tax collector. One who was so loathed that if he entered a house, the house was unclean. And Jesus doesn't just enter in with him. He calls him friend, co-laborer, disciple, and fellowships with him. And with the friends that Matthew brings in. Pointing out in practice what he's telling John's disciples. It's all new wine and new wineskins. A whole new view of what's really important to God. For any of that would be willing to come to him. And have a heart of love toward him. Out of that would flow love towards others. Look at what we've seen so far. As we've looked at these past few chapters of Matthew. Jesus healed a leper. A Gentile centurion servant. A mother-in-law. A demon-possessed man in an area that wanted nothing to do with him. And then he comes back to a paralytic man being dropped in his lap through the roof. One that he calls his son and forgives and then heals. Then he calls a tax collector. And then dines with all those friends and sinners of Matthew's. He goes from there to being touched by an unclean woman who he calls his daughter and heals. All outcast. All hopeless. All outside the accepted Jewish society. All scorned. All lowly. And yet, all accepted with love by Jesus. He had told that, those scribes, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Throughout all of these encounters, that's what I see. That's what I see there. Jesus, full of love, full of compassion, full of mercy, with all power, with all authority, binding broken hearts, setting captives free, all of which points to his ultimate mission of eternal healing and fellowship. What love he showed. None of these people found what they needed in the law. None of these people found what they needed in the religious system or the religiosity of the day. In fact, they were all outcasts and scorned by the society that they longed to be a part of. They didn't receive any comfort, any solace, any healing or mercy. They did not find any representation of the love of God from the religious leaders and teachers, the religious elite of the day who were too busy presenting themselves in self-righteous perfection inside of the religious system they had warped and twisted into a man-centered task-oriented system of rules and regulations so far from the heart of God. So far from the heart of God that they could not even recognize when the God they professed to be righteous enough to stand before showed up and stood before them. No, they didn't find the healing, the love, the compassion, the mercy, the touch they needed in any of that. And yet when God himself comes in the body of Jesus Christ, 
as they gazed into the eyes of the one who stepped out of eternity and into the world he created when they were touched by the one who not just professed love for them, but embodied love for them by taking their infirmity, their disgrace, their shame, their loneliness and disillusionment and making it his, by making them his, touching a leper and taking his uncleanness as his own, going toward the house of a Roman Gentile centurion to heal his slave, only to marvel at the man's understanding of the nature of the real authority that Jesus had. Grasping hold of the hand of a woman, a fisherman's mother-in-law, and picking her up out of bed to heal her. Showing his divine power to his disciples by calming the winds and the sea. Delivering two men oppressed and possessed by demons in an area that didn't even want him around. Healing and forgiving and accepting a paralytic man and calling him his son. Accepting and calling a disillusioned tax collector into his inner circle. Naked, naming him Matthew, the gift of Jehovah, turning to a woman suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years and healing her, accepting her, giving her peace and calling her his own daughter. That's why in Matthew 9, 36, when Jesus looks around and Matthew tells us, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like a sheep, having no shepherd. All the ones that should have been tending to them, these were the outcast. These were the ones that were shunned. And it's the ones we see Jesus went to first. He went to them first to bind the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. Oh, how amazing grace is. That the love of God embodied in Jesus Christ is shown in his actions here. Those instructions that we're going through throughout the book of 1 John to love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. To love others as ourselves. All those commands were given embodied in the life of Jesus Christ. It's what he did in example for us as he walked the face of the earth. All those people, all of them, that he touched, redeemed, restored. Binding the brokenhearted and setting the captives free. I think this is pretty amazing. And what Jesus did there. And how he looks at these people. How he tends to these people. And he couldn't have cared less. How he was viewed by the ones who were religious. But what he cared about were the ones that were outside of the norm. That were outside. That were just broken hearted and downtrodden. Had no hope at all. That's who he went to. Hope for the hopeless. What a great God we serve. Next week, we're going to continue through this chapter and examine that interaction of where Jesus was heading in a little more detail. And we're going to continue going through that. But that's where we're going to leave off tonight. Just thinking about who Jesus is, what he did, what he was able to do in these last few chapters, in all, the ones that he tended to, the ones that he called from a tax booth to be his disciple and the ones that he tended to and cared about. You know, if, if he cared about them that much, he cares about you just as much. And as you're going through life and as we're looking at things that are going on and as we go through struggles and we can think of all these things, he's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. He's never going to leave us alone. And it's nice to know that Jesus cares when our hearts are broken. He cares when we are struggling. He cares about all those things because he told us that was one of his missions. Like I keep saying, bind the brokenhearted, set the captive free. He's an amazing God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you did for us and that you are the one that came to set us free. And oh Lord, I pray that we would walk in your ways, that we would be like you. And Lord, as we walk in through our day, that we wouldn't allow our hearts to grow in such a way where we look at others and we look at them 
And we wonder what caused them to be like they are. That, that we would struggle in seeing them be yours. But Lord, in you, there really isn't a them. You came to die for all of us. All of mankind. You died for all of mankind. And oh, how you long to set us free. Oh, how you long for our hearts to grow like into, into the, the image of Jesus Christ. May we walk in love like you did. May we be cognizant that all we are is sinners like these people, ones who just needed your touch. We could all lay before you like that paralytic man and have you say, oh, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. Even though we have all the other prayers on our heart, all the other desires on our heart, oh Lord, may we rejoice in the fact that you have forgiven our sins. May we have faith like those men who dug a hole through someone else's roof just to get their friend to you. May we have the faith to long to just touch the hem of your garment, just trusting that if we could just touch you. And Lord, may we have the faith of thinking that even in our search, our struggle, our desire to be close to you, that you're doing everything necessary to get through the crowd to us as well. I'm grateful that you like, you love, and you long for our presence to be with you. You want to be with us. I'm so grateful for that, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the grace that you pour on us so freely. We love you, Lord Jesus. Be with us this evening, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.